Hello and welcome back. In this lecture we're going to talk about the central nervous system and specifically we're going to talk about the brain. In a separate lecture we'll talk about the cranial nerves and we'll do um, also the spinal cord. So the central nervous system is made of the brain and spinal cord and the peripheral nervous system is made of all the nerves that come out of the um, out of the central nervous system. They're going to be made up of spinal nerves and cranial nerves. So in this lecture, as I just stated before, we're going to just focus in on um, when talking about the, um, the brain. And uh, we will come back and talk about the, uh, the spinal cord at, in a future lecture. Just trying to show you the divisions of the of the nervous system here. If we take a look at the top, we have the central nervous system. It's made of the brain and spinal cord. And uh, if we look at the peripheral nervous system, it's all of the nerves that are outside of the brain and spinal cord. So those will include your um, your nerves and your spinal that your spinal nerves and your um, cranial nerves. So we can see that there are certain kinds of uh, divisions here. We have some of the peripheral nerves are going to be receptors. They're going to you know be um, uh, sending information about smell, taste, vision, balance, and hearing. Some of the these nerves are going to be um, sensing or monitoring internal organs. And then some of them are going to be monitoring things like the skeletal muscles, joints, and skin surface. All of these make up the afferent division of the peripheral nervous system, sending information to the central nervous system. Central nervous system, of course, is going to be your information processing center. And then they'll send out commands via, via the motor neurons, and that's the efferent uh, division and uh, this is going to be divided further subdivided into the somatic nervous system and the autonomic nervous system. The somatic nervous system is generally speaking going to go to your skeletal muscles and uh, the autonomic nervous system is made of the parasympathetic nervous system and the sympathetic nervous system. So the parasympathetic nervous system is your resting state nervous system. Sympathetic nervous system is your flight or flight uh, system. It's going to help you respond to dangerous kinds of, uh, of stimuli. And these are going to go down and affect all things like smooth muscle tissue, cardiac muscle tissue, glands, and such. So we'll talk more about the peripheral nervous system in a later lecture, but in this particular lecture we want to focus in on the brain. The brain is a really complex organ, and uh, we're only going to touch the surface of it in this particular class. If you look at the uh, divisions of the brain, um, the large portion of the brain, I guess what you consider to be the, the major portion of the brain, is called the cerebrum. This is where you have conscious thought, things like uh, you know control of your motor um, activities. Uh, this is where sensation occurs, interpretation of sensation, uh, vision, smell. Uh, this is where also taste is going to occur, memory storage. So lots of things are, are, are going on in the cerebrum. It's a, it's a huge part of our brain, and uh, we, we have a very well-developed cerebrum compared to other uh, vertebrate animals. The brain is also uh, has a subdivision called the diencephalon. The diencephalon is made up of the thalamus and the hypothalamus. Um, these are, are very deep inside the brain. And uh, they're very important, uh, um, you know, uh, parts of the brain. They're going to be relays for sensory information. They're going to control emotions, uh, autonomic functions, homeostasis, uh, hormone production. All these things will occur um, via the, uh, the, the parts of the diencephalon. We also have a brain stem. The brain stem was, it consists of the midbrain, the pons, and the medulla oblongata. These are these are uh, really important parts. Um, they help us to have reflexes. Uh, they help us to uh, maintain alertness and consciousness. They help to relay information coming from the spinal cord or from the body to the parts of the brain that that information needs to go to. Um, they uh, also are going to be regulating things like uh, uh, respiration, digestion, um, and then circulation uh, as well. So really super duper important parts. Um, you know, all of these parts here, you know, you have really no control over. They're involuntary. Cerebrum, you do have volitional control uh, over some of those parts. And, and, uh, and, and you can actually understand that those parts are working because you have consciousness of those activities. The cerebellum is in the back. It's this little part back here. 
and uh, the cerebellum is going to be really important in, um, in coordinating physical activities. So uh, it does coordinate all the motions that we make, and uh, it has many other functions, but that's one of the main ones that we can talk about right now. So covering the brain, there, there are protective coverings called meninges, and these consist of uh, uh, three separate layers, the dura mater, the arachnoid mater, and the pia mater. Uh, these are very tough connective tissues that uh, have blood vessels and nerves in them, uh, and it's part of the brain that actually can sense pain. So if I did brain surgery on you, I'd want to um, you know, use anesthesia to numb the meninges. You don't have to use anesthesia on the surface of the brain because it itself does not have sensory receptors. The dura mater is going to be the outermost layer and it connects the meninges to the skull bones and it forms a, 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 co a covering around the inner portion of the cranial bones. So this is a very, very tough layer um, that, uh, that will anchor um, your brain so it doesn't slosh around too much inside of your cranium. It covers and protects the spinal cord as well. The arachnoid mater is the middle layer and between the arachnoid mater and the pia mater is what we call a subarachnoid space. Um, this is going to contain cerebral spinal fluid, or CSF, and your brain literally floats. Uh, your brain has a weight, but that weight is reduced because of the buoyancy, um, because it's floating in the cerebral spinal fluid. So literally, your brain is floating right now, and as your head moves, your brain's sloshing around to a degree, but it's anchored in place by the uh, dura mater. The pia mater is your innermost layer and it attaches to the brain and spinal cord. It's rich in blood vessels and it nourishes the, um, your um, central nervous system tissues, the brain and spinal cord. And this is just a picture showing you uh, a different view uh, of the thing, it's uh, of the brain. Uh, this is a, a coronal view, so uh, it's been cut through, and it allows you to see the dura mater, the arachnoid mater, and the pia mater. You can see that the pia mater covers over the gray matter here of the brain. We have the arachnoid matter is this uh, purple layer here, and then the dura mater is connected to the cranial bones. Um, so there, there's a subarachnoid space where that cerebral spinal fluid sits in. Um, there are places like the dural sinus where your cerebral spinal fluid will move through and dump into your uh, venous circulation to be put back into your bloodstream. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Um, I like this picture because you can see the gray ma matter. The gray matter is the actual part of the central nervous system that has cells, and the white matter are uh, the axons that come out of those cells with their fatty myelin sheath created by the oligodendrocytes. So you can see all that in this particular picture. Um, <clears throat> I really like the picture of the spinal cord uh, wrapped around by the meninges. It's easy to see. You can see the pia mater actually touches the central nervous system tissue. The arachnoid mater is, uh, is uh, the middle layer, and you can see the subarachnoid space is where that cerebral spinal fluid would be, uh, would be circulating. Uh, we then have the dura mater, and uh, that would be connecting um, and surrounding the tissues and protecting, but connecting it to the, the, uh, the under, overlying bones. <coughs> and this picture over here just shows you a, um, a transverse view of that, um, of that. And this is just showing you a little different view. It's showing you the um, cerebral cortex, the pia mater over top, the subarachnoid space where your cerebral spinal fluid would be sitting, the arachnoid uh, mater, and then the, uh, there's a little dural space there, a little space in between the arachnoid mater and the dura mater. And inside the dura mater will be these dura sinuses. These are going to be areas where uh, fluids can be uh, put into venous circulation. So this is part of the venous circulation that helps to collect fluids and drain it from the brain. Just showing you one more picture of the connections here. So we have the pia mater, the subarachnoid space with the cerebral spinal fluid, and you can see that it can actually go into the, the venous circulation. So we can go into that, uh, that uh, sinus, that dural sinus, and dump the fluids in. Well, the brain also has internal uh, chambers, hollow chambers, and these are called ventricles. And these are hollow, but they're filled with cerebral spinal fluid. 
This is a, uh, a side view, uh, a profile view of the various ventricles. We have the lateral ventricles, and you have them on each side inside of the brain. We have the um, inner ventricular foramen, uh, foramen, which connects the two lateral ventricles together. We have the third ventricle, which is kind of in the center of the brain. Then we have the cerebral aqu aqueduct, which connects these fluids down to the fourth ventricle, which is right near the uh, the brain in the brainstem and near the um, cerebellum, and then that connects in with the central canal, which is a hollow chamber down the center of the spinal cord. And again, all of this is going to be all of these ventricles and uh, the aqueducts and canals are going to be full of cerebral spinal fluid. This fluid is very, very important to uh, the functioning of the brain. The cerebral spinal fluid is made um, inside the brain in several different locations. Um, they're made in these little these little places called the choroid plexus, the choroid plexus, and uh, we have specialized um, ependymal. Uh, neuroglial cells that are going to have, uh, you know, they're going to have the microvilli there. They're going to be very specialized in, um, in producing the cerebral spinal fluid. There are tight junctions between the uh, ependymal cells so that, so that materials can't work in this way and materials can't go this way from the, from the bloodstream to the um, to the to the, uh, the the ventricles so this is representing here a capillary coming through and there's always a blood-brain barrier that allows for the brain to be protected from the materials that are inside of the bloodstream so anything that's going to be come that any plasma that comes out and uh, becomes uh, tissue fluid um, none of that can go th in directly into the brain, but has to go through these very specialized ependymal cells. So these ependymal cells are going to make cerebral spinal fluid. Uh, it's a very special fluid that's going to nourish, bathe, support, and protect uh, your brain cells. And uh, as you go away from the choroid plexus, plexus, plexuses, we're going to get into the just our general um, ependymal cells that line the ventricles. So you can see that there is um, fluids that are coming out of the brain and fluids that are going into the brain. So these particular cells are relatively porous and allow the exchange of fluids. So, but the um, but the specialized choroid plexus ependymal cells are going to produce the cerebral spinal fluid. And if we have waste inside the cerebral spinal fluid, they're going to take and remove those wastes. Remember, they have the um, they have these microvilli, so they're going to remove these waste and put it into bloodstream. So the bloodstream can take the waste to the kidneys uh, and excrete those uh, out of the body. This is showing you several locations uh, for this uh, choroid uh, um, plexus. So we have some right up in here. Uh, this is the choroid plexus of the third ventricle. And then we have the choroid plexus of the fourth ventricle down here. So uh, the choroid plexuses are not found everywhere, but they are found in certain areas of the brain. So they will dump cerebral spinal fluid into, um, into the, um, the various chambers of the brain. That cerebral spinal fluid will circulate for a while. There will be materials that will diffuse in and out of the, of the choroid plexus. And uh, there will also be fluids that will diffuse in and out of the brain tissue through the regular ependymal cells. At some point in time, um, you know, that cerebral spinal fluid can be taken out of circulation and be put into, so you can see the cerebral spinal fluid is, is let me change my color pen here. So cerebral spinal fluid is, is circulating all around the brain, okay, where this white, where I'm, and eventually it can make its way into the dural sinus and get into venous circulation and then be taken out of the brain uh, through your blood, uh, your bloodstream. This is just showing what I just indicated. It's showing the cerebral spinal fluid moving out into the dural sinuses um, so that you can uh, take that out into venous circulation. You don't want too much cerebral spinal fluid. You don't want too little of it. It has to be regulated and maintained in homeostasis. And so those parts do that particular job. Okay, so now we just finished talking about the coverings and how we create uh, the fluids to fill the internal chambers. We'll now get into talking about the actual um, brain parts. So we're going to talk, talk first about the cerebrum. You can see a nice picture of the cerebrum here. Um, the brain is, uh, is, is uh, basically a lot of fat. 
when you take it out of a human uh, body, uh, it actually will collapse on itself unless you preserve it in um, special pickling juice. Um, you can see there is a glistening layer of the surface. That's the pia mater. Uh, you can see blood vessels that are in these little um, these little grooves here. These little grooves are called sulci, and uh, or sulcus would be uh, another way to say that. Sulci would be plural. Sulcus would be singular. And these swellings right here are called uh, gyri. Okay, so, um, and you can see a separation down here. This is the cerebellum down here, and this would be your brainstem down here. And uh, inside would be the, the diencephalon that we can't see. So there's a lot of surface regions. We'll be looking at those in lab, some of the surface regions of the brain. But uh, a couple of the, the things that are pretty important would be the central sulcus. This kind of divides the frontal lobe from the parietal lobe back here. So there are some major lobes of the brain. We have the frontal, the parietal, the occipital, and the temporal. Um, you can see the cerebellums back here. That's not part of the cerebrum, though. And you have the pons and the medulla. There's a couple landmarks in the spinal cord over here. So lateral sulcus will be a division between the, the temporal lobe and the frontal lobe. So each of these little grooves, every sulci, every gyrus has a, a specific name to it. Looking at it from a top view, we have the longitudinal fissure, which divides the brain into a right and left part. Remember, this is an anatomical position, so right side is the cadaver's right side and left side is the cadaver's left side. So the central fissure is a major dividing point between the right and left lobes of the brain. Right and left hemispheres of the brain, excuse me. This is a, a sagittal view. So if I cut mid-sagittally, you can see the frontal lobe, the parietal lobe, the occipital lobe. Uh, the temporal lobe has been removed in this particular, uh, in this particular uh, diagram. Uh, I can see the central sulcus dividing the frontal and the parietal lobes. I can see the parieto occipital sulcus, which divides the parietal and occipital lobes. And we can see deeper in, we can see uh, a little piece of the midbrain, the pons, the medulla oblongata, and, uh, and some other structures here. We'll look at the thalamus and hypothalamus in a little bit later. There is a connecting band of white matter, which is uh, essentially axons um, with the myelin sheath around them, called the corpus callosum. This corpus callosum uh, connects the right hemisphere and the left hemisphere, and it's a major feature of the brain. The cerebellum is kind of cool. It looks like cauliflower. It looks like cauliflower to me, cut in cross section or in sagittal section, and you can see the gray matter, which are the cells that process information, and then you can see all the white matter that I'm stippling here. And this is just a sagittal view of a real brain, um, and, and you can see the corpus callosum, uh, you can see the thalamus, the hypothalamus, the little pituitary gland, we can see the midbrain, pons, medulla, spinal cord, cerebellum, and you can see some, some of the lobes of the brain. You can see the occipital lobe, the parietal lobe, and the frontal lobe. Okay, so there's some of the things you can see. We can also see these fluid-filled hollow cavities. These are the ventricles here and here and here. So you can see some of those ventricles. And uh, this is just taking a little piece of the brain and a little, a little slice of it. So you can see the gyrus, which are the, um, which are the, the rising portions. And the sulcus would be the little grooves that are going in. So um, uh, you can also see the gray matter, which is where you have the cells. That's not very thick. It's very, very few cells. Um, in the in the human brain, in 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 terms of um, the amount of white matter and connectivity through axons that there is, so the really the outside surface of the brain is the processing part, and then the interior portions are going to be a lot of white matter that are going to be connecting axons, um, which connect nerve cells to nerve cells. Um, there's another little part of the brain, if you pull the frontal and, and temporal lobes, you can see that there is the insula, so it's a little interior portion or lobe that can't be seen from the outside. And there's the insula just showing you some of the gyri of the insula from the inside view. 
This is the bottom of the brain and uh, our bottom view of the brain. And you can see the frontal and the temporal. And uh, you can see the cerebellum here. You can't really see the occipital lobe. It's being, uh, it's being covered up in this particular view. But we can see the pons and the medulla. Uh, the midbrain would be a little bit deeper in. Um, so, and the pituitary gland has been removed here. Uh, what's kind of cool about this uh, particular um, diagram is that you can see some of the cranial nerves. We're going to talk about these cranial nerves in a separate lecture, but you can see the olfactory nerve. Um, you know, your eyes would be, uh, this would be the optic nerves coming down. Your eyes would be here and, uh, and over here. So there is a nerve that connects your, uh, you know, your eyes with the, with the brain. Uh, you can see some of the other nerves here. We'll talk about each of these different cranial nerves and how they uh, exit the brain and, and cause us to be able to communicate to different parts of the body and, um, and control different functions or send sensory information to the brain. Uh, this is just a clay model showing you the frontal lobe, uh, the, the parietal lobe, the occipital lobe, and the temporal lobe. Insula is not seen in this particular diagram. And uh, so let's go ahead and we'll talk about some of the different lobes. Now, from uh, different kinds of research that we've done on humans, we have discovered that, uh, that these lobes um, actually do have different jobs. Every portion of the brain has a little different job. So you can study uh, brain surgery, accidents. You can study strokes. Uh, uh, cancer victims that have specific tumors removed, and you can study accident victims. Uh, you can study all different kinds of uh, of uh, case studies or clinical studies of people that have lost parts, you know, functions of their body, and then determine what part of the brain uh, was actually damaged um, or lost. So we have a, a good understanding of of how the brain is mapped. Uh, we can also do open brain surgery on people while they're awake and stimulate it with electrical stimuli and ask people what they're sensing while we're stimuli stimulating different parts of the brain. So the primary motor cortex of the frontal lobe is going to control skeletal muscle um, muscles. So you do have a part of your brain that uh, there was a map of your body that controls all the skeletal muscles of the, of the body. There's a premotor cortex which controls learned motor skills um, that are of a repetitious or pattern nature. So when you learn to type on a computer or text with your thumbs or playing an instrument, all of these things are, are, um, are learned and they're programmed into uh, a part of your brain called the premotor cortex. Broca's area is a part of the frontal lobe which controls the muscles involved in speech. Usually it's in the left hemisphere, but in some folks it's in the right hemisphere. And then the frontal eye field controls voluntary movements of the eyes. There's also in the frontal lobe a prefrontal cortex, and uh, this is a, a, a very important part of, the, of, the, of your brain. Uh, it's a multimodal association area, so it, it uh, associates uh, various kinds of things. Um, it's involved in cognition, uh, intellect, personality, ethics, um, you know, it basically makes you, you, and if I removed it, you would no longer be you. You'd be, uh, you know, a different person. And just showing you somewhere where these things are located, if we look at the primary motor cortex, this is located right here, uh, anterior to the central sulcus. Uh, a little bit in front of the motor cortex is the premotor cortex. We then have the frontal eye field that's located right here. Broca's area is located right here in this dashed line, so I'll just put it right here. This is Broca's area, which controls speech. And then we have the prefrontal cortex, which is involved in, you know, working memory, ethics, management of your behavior, um, solving complex problems. All of those things are done in the prefrontal uh, cortex. Your parietal lobe is involved in sensations. Uh, there is a part of your parietal lobe called the primary somatosensory cortex, and this receives information from sensory receptors in your skin. There's also the somatosensory association cortex, which integrates sensory information to produce an understanding of objects being felt. So if I gave you a bag of, let's say, silverware, um, and asked you to reach in and touch it, the primary somatosensory cortex will, will send information to your brain about you know, what you're touching, the information will then go to the somatosensory association cortex and integrate sensory information to produce 
you know, your understanding of what's being felt. Is it cold feeling? Is it metallic? Is it is it furry? Is it soft? All of that is done by a different part of the brain, not the primary somatosensory cortex. And as we talked about before when we did the uh, integumentary system, um, there is a map of our, of our body in our brain. And each part of our body is represented by this. So we have a motor cortex map and we have a somatosensory cortex map. The motor cortex map has uh, basically parts of the brain. Th these different parts of the, of the brain are dedicated to the, to the corresponding parts of the body that you can see drawn in this diagram. So we have really good uh, use of uh, our hands because we have a lot of area of the brain dedicated to the hands. We have a good use of our tongue and face muscles because we have a lot of area of the body dedicated to that. We have a lot of sensation that we feel of our face and hands because we have a lot of part of our brain that's dedicated to it. And you know our legs have less sensation because there's less part of the brain that's dedicated to that. Okay, so there's whole maps of the human body and the brain. And uh, of course, if you had a stroke in this particular area, you'd lose sensation of your face. If you had a stroke in this particular area of your body, you'd lose the ability to control the muscles of your leg, uh, of your lower leg and foot. The occipital lobe is going to be the part of the brain that will allow you to have the uh, vision. Um, the primary visual cortex receives information from the retina of the eye about what you're seeing. The visual association area in the occipital lobe uses past visual experiences to interpret new visual stimuli that you're looking at. So if you look at a grape, uh, you know a grape, at least a, a green grape is green, it's round, it's smooth. Um, you know, you have stored experiences about grapes, and when you look at a new grape, it'll actually compare what you're seeing to those past stored um, information, and then you can interpret it as a, as a grape. The temporal lobe is going to have a lot of different functions to it. One of the functions is going to be um, hearing things. So the primary auditory cortex interprets pitch, loudness, and location of sounds sensed by your ears. So you do have an inner ear that senses information from your surroundings, and uh, it sends that information to the temporal lobe to be interpreted. The auditory association area perceives the sound stimulus. Um, and what I mean by perceives it is it uh, if it hears information, it will perceive it as a scream, as music, as noise, white noise, um, background noise. Uh, it'll, it'll perceive the information that the primary auditory cortex is, um, is interpreting. There, we also have in the temporal lobe the olfactory cortex, and this allows for the awareness of odors. And just to show you a few of those things we just talked about, here is that, uh, that somatosensory cortex. Here's the sensory uh, association area of the parietal lobe. Okay, here's our visual cortex and our visual association area of the uh, occipital lobe. Here is where you hear the auditory association area. And, uh, excuse me, that's where you interpret uh, things that you're hearing. Auditory cortex allows you to perceive those things. Uh, we also have... Um, you know, the ability to smell things, which is the olfactory cortex in the temporal lobe. That corpus callosum is going to be that large band of connecting fibers that I talked about earlier. And uh, it's, uh, it's a thick band. It's made of, basically it's made of fatty tissue because it's a lot of myelin. Um, there's tremendous numbers of axons that are going from the right hemisphere to the left hemisphere and from the left hemisphere to the right hemisphere. So it connects the two brain hemispheres. Um, it carries messages between those hemispheres so that you can um, divide labor up, you know, like your left hemisphere will do different jobs, your right hemisphere does different jobs, and then they can communicate with the, with the separate sides about what they uh, have done so that you have a whole uh, awareness of what's going on. So that corpus callosum you can see is going to be made of lots of fibers. These are called commissural fibers, and they're they go between the hemispheres. But in the actual hemispheres, there's also association fibers. So these would be fibers or tracks of, of uh, axons that are con connecting nerve cells of different regions of the different lobes to other regions of the different lobes within the same hemisphere. 
So association fibers are within hemispheres and they connect the hemisphere to different parts of the hemispheres. Um, but the commiseral uh, fibers are going to connect hemispheres to hemispheres. We then have projection fibers which are going to take and connect the various parts of the cerebrum to lower parts of the body. And yes, you can see that within the, um, within the medulla oblongata, there is this uh, thing called uh, uh, decazation. And decazation is where you have a crossing over of the fibers so that the left side of the brain is going to connect, contact the right side of the body and the right side of the body is going to connect the left side of the, uh, the left side of the brain is going to connect to the left side of the body. So that's kind of confusing, but that's what occurs. So literally the left hemisphere of the brain controls the right side of the body and vice versa. Okay, so we have those projection fibers which communicate from the brain to the body and from the body to the brain. So there is a whole lot of fibers in the brain. And if you were, if I erase this ink here, if you look at the part of the brain that literally has cells that process information, you can see that that part of the brain is, um, is very, very minimal. So if I just shaded that part of the brain that contains brain cells, it is basically the gray matter on the outside surface. So that's the part of the brain that thinks. And we're talking just millimeters in, uh, in thickness. The great majority of the brain is going to be made of this, these white, this white matter, which are the axons, the myelinated axons of the, um, of the brain cells that are extending out trying to communicate to other brain cells. So we have a huge portion of the brain is going to be these white this white matter and it connects all you know it's the it's the connecting points it's the axons that connect other parts of the brain. Okay, so and it within even within the brain there are regions of gray matter. We'll talk about these various nuclei. A nuclei is a, a a part of the brain that has brain cells that are processing, but there are nuclei that are spread through the interior of the brain. In you know, they're little islands within the white matter of the um, of the brain. And this is just showing you uh, just a real uh, diagram of this. If I just got highlighter here, I can highlight some of this for you. So these would be maybe I'll use the colors that they're actually using. So these would be the commiseral fibers communicating from hemisphere to hemisphere. Um, we have the association fibers, which would be connecting within hemispheres, different portions of different, uh, you know, within the hemispheres, connecting different cells to different portions within the hemisphere. And then the uh, projection fibers are going to go from the, from the body to the brain and from the brain to the body. So they're going to be connecting in this kind of fashion, going up and connecting in this kind of fashion. Now, we don't really, you know, so we don't know how all these things are connected. Um, there is a, a, a thing called the connectome, which is all the, con it's a concept of all the connections of the brain. And we, we don't have a true map of the connectome yet. Uh, it probably will take years and years and years and decades to be able to connect, figure out how every nerve cell is connected to every other nerve cell. Um, because some nerve cells connect to thousands of other cells. So, and there are, um, billions of nerve cells within the brain. So maybe one day we'll actually be able to see brain connections when people make the claim that there are missing connections in the brain and that's why someone did you know, a crime or something like that. Um, that's, that's a statement that can't really be made because we don't know the connections of the brain. I will tell you though, if for some reason there is a problem where you get a, a cutting of the brain, a cutting of these connections, there will be dysfunction for sure. So if you ever sever one of these connections, there will be uh, a problem that you will have um, from breaking those connections. But we don't know how the brain is fully connected yet. We have a good understanding of how many parts of the brain are connected, but not the whole thing, how it's all connected together. This is just showing you a, um, a mid-sagittal view of those fibers. So we have the association fibers, which are connecting cells within hemispheres with cells within hemispheres. The commiseral fibers are going to be going from hemisphere to hemisphere to connect the hemispheres. And projecting fibers are going from the brain to the body and from the body to the brain. 
Okay, within the cerebral cortex, there are basal nuclei. These are located deep within the cerebral white matter. They're little islands of gray matter, and uh, they do have cells that process information. And we do have some different uh, uh, basal nuclei. We have the caudate nucleus, the putamen, and the glob uh, glob globus pallidus. Excuse me. These are three uh, of the various nuclei that make up basal nuclei. Um, they each have a different function, but they generally function to inhibit unnecessary movement. They play a role in cognition and emotion, and they are important in performing motor functions. So if you tell your hand to do a particular function, the, um, the basal nuclei are going to help to perform that motor function. They're going to help in the processing to coordinate and help in that particular action that you're commanding your body to do. When these basal nuclei are damaged by um, brain damage, stroke, or, um, or uh, cancers grow in them, then you lose the ability to perform smooth motor functions. And here's where they're located inside. So if I did, uh, in this particular view, this is a, uh, a view through the, uh, a transverse view through the brain. And uh, you can see the caudate nucleus, the putamen, and the uh, globus pallidus. So, so these are just little islands, little pockets of gray matter within the, um, within the uh, white matter. And that's what they look like under a real sliced human brain, not a, not a drawing. So you can see the gray matter. Yeah, I know it looks tan. Uh, people call it gray matter. So this is the gray matter of the caudate nucleus. And uh, this is the gray matter of the putamen. And this is the gray matter of the globus, uh, globus uh, pallidus. So let's go ahead and we'll talk about other um, pieces of the brain. We'll, uh, we'll go ahead and look at the diencephalon, and then we'll look at the brainstem, and then finalize our talk with the uh, cerebellum. Okay, so, yeah, let's do this. Let's ink this out. And so, when you look at this particular view right here, um, this is this part of the brain. So, they've taken this part of the brain right here, and they're just looking at this portion of it. Okay, so this portion right here is what the next diagram is showing you. Uh, it's removed all the other parts from around it. So the diencephalon is going to be made up of the thalamus and the hypothalamus. And then the brainstem, we'll find out, is made of the midbrain, the pons, and the medulla oblongata. Let's talk about the diencephalon first. The diencephalon consists of the thalamus, the hypothalamus, and the epithalamus. The thalamus is considered to be the gateway to the cerebral cortex. Now, I know you think you have free will to do everything that you want to do, but literally the thalamus is choosing what sensory information is going to your conscious awareness. Most sensory information is not going to your conscious awareness. And I'll just give you an example. So right now, uh, think about the clothing that's sitting on the surface of your skin. Now, before I said anything, you weren't thinking about that clothing and, clothing and didn't feel it. But now you're aware of it because I just told you to be aware of it. The thalamus was taking all that sensory information and not allowing your cerebral cortex to be aware of that until you, until you literally focused on it consciously. Think about the hair on your head. Now you can feel it. Think about the socks on your feet. Now you can feel that. So, But 10 minutes from now, you'll forget about it. The thalamus will choose not to give you that information. Um, there's all kinds of background noises that are probably in the environment around you. Uh, hear your dog barking. Listen to your cat purring. So all that information. How about your heartbeat? Can you feel it now? You didn't before because the thalamus was choosing for you not to be aware of it. So, you know, you might think you have free will, but you really don't for sensory information coming into your body. All sensory information except for smell. Smell has a direct route right to your cerebral cortex. But all sensory information except for smell has to pass through the thalamus to get to the cerebral cortex. So literally it's a gateway to, the, um, to your higher brain centers. Um, it's a very sophisticated part uh, of your brain. If I, if I just go and show you, you do have two of them, one on each side. So you do have two uh, thal thalami. Uh, one on each side. You can see where it's located right there. And there are parts to it. 
So there are specific nuclei or, uh, uh, or gray matter that uh, does different particular different uh, things. So for example, the anterior nuclei is involved in the limbic system. The medial nuclei is involved in, in contact in the frontal lobes and, and, contact, and, and sending information to that. Um, so the, uh, the, uh, you know, the auditory input comes in at the medial geniculate nucleus. The lateral geniculate nucleus is going to be dealing with the sensory information coming from literally your eyeballs send information to this lateral geniculate nucleus and then it sends information to the, um, the, the visual cortex of the occipital lobe. So we have, so, so each part of these nuclei do different particular jobs. I, I'm not really going to ask you all of that on a test, but I do want you to be aware that these things are very sophisticated. They do have concentrations of nerve cells inside of them. These concentrations are called nuclei and they each have their own particular job that they perform. Collectively, you can see this is really important because you have sensory information coming into this and then information is going out to various parts of the brain where the information needs to go. And this is the this is just a it looks like a MRI of the brain showing you the thalamus uh, in the central part right there. Um, the hypothalamus is located right below the thalamus. That's why they call it the hypothalamus. So the hypothalamus is uh, is critical for uh, many different functions. It is the center of your brain that it is going to be involved in emotional response. So pleasure, fear, rage, sex drive, these very, very primitive urges that allow us to survive are going to be housed in the hypothalamus. And it's not a huge part of the brain. If you look at it right there, it's not a huge part of the brain, but geez, it has so many different uh, important functions that it provides for us. Um, it does regulate our sleep-wake cycles. It controls all kinds of uh, endocrine, uh, the release of all kinds of hormones from our endocrine system. It regulates hunger, thirst, body temperature. Um, and just like the, the thalamus, it is made of different kinds of nuclei. These nuclei are going to each uh, basically be concentrations of nerve cells and they each have a different job that they perform. For example, the posterior hypothalamic uh, area is involved in shivering. Um, and so the uh, mammillary body is going to be involved in feeding and sucking reflexes. Um, there is a part that's involved in uh, helping to control GI tract function and water balance and body temperature and blood pressure and stress and water balance. Okay, there's a part that's our biological clock. Um, the way we know that these things work is they have taken cats and they have done studies where they take electrodes and they stimulate parts of these nuclei or they damage the nuclei altogether and then observe what happens to the cat um, or other animals that they're working on. So we've done a lot of experimentation to figure out what these things each do. And I just put this little graphic here showing you the various, um, the various parts of these. Uh, you know, I probably won't ask you too many questions about what specific uh, nuclei do. I will ask you what the hypothalamus does. I will let, you know, I will uh, require you to know that there are nuclei, um, but asking you specific ones, I probably will not uh, have you know those things. Um, you know, this is an introductory class and that's a very high level skill. So, um, but it is kind of interesting to note, note the, the various um, activities that different uh, of, uh, nuclei uh, do. So just to see how super important the hypothalamus is. So I do know, want you to know what the hypothalamus does. Uh, that, it, that you can link a specific nuclei to a specific function is not necessary for this particular class. The epithalamus is made of the uh, pineal gland. The pineal gland extends from the posterior border of the hypothalamus. The um, pineal gland it produces a hormone called melatonin. Uh, which regulates our sleep-wake cycles. So you can see the pineal gland is located right there at the posterior of the thalamus. Thalamus being this region right here, and here's your hypothalamus right here. Um, that's not a gland to under underappreciate. Uh, so if you get that particular hormone messed up, like if you travel from east to west, 
and uh, on a plane you know that you'll go through different time zones and uh, it leads to jet lag if you go and travel across many time zones. Um, that's because of disruption. There is a disruption of the of the melatonin being produced. When you close your eyes and sleep at night, melatonin is created, and during the daytime, um, it's not being created. So that that's a signaling to your brain when you should be asleep and when you're awake. And you can mess that up by east-west travel. So the brainstem consists of the midbrain, the pons, and the medulla oblongata, and you can see the brainstem. Uh, here. So we have the midbrain, the pons, and the medulla oblongata. Spinal cord is part of uh, the central nervous system, but it's not part of the brain. So the midbrain, it coordinates uh, head and eye movement um, it, when we visually follow a moving object. So if you take and follow my finger across the screen there, the midbrain, there's parts of the midbrain that are controlling your eyes tracing that particular path. The midbrain is also responsible for the startle reflex stimulated by sound. So if anybody's ever scared you before, there's parts of the midbrain that are going to be dealing with that. Um, the midbrain is a very, very complex part, and uh, this particular graphic shows you um, some of the complexity of it. So what you're looking at is a view of the midbrain um, exclusively. You can see that there are uh, various parts of it, such as your superior and inferior colliculi. These are uh, portions of the brain that are going to be involved in um, uh, reflexes involving visual stimuli and reflexes vo uh, um, involving auditory stimuli. We then have some, uh, some other parts of this uh, um, midbrain as well um, that are regulating. So the substantia uh, nigra is going to be regulating uh, activity in the basal nucleus. So it's involved in, in coordinating nice smooth fluid movements. The red nucleus is going to um, be involved in controlling muscle tone. The reticular formation is going to be um, involved in helping to maintain consciousness. And uh, we'll talk about reticular formation in a minute uh, because it's actually found in the midbrain and the pons and the medulla. Um, there's also uh, going to be uh, some connecting areas, the cerebral uh, peduncles, which are connecting areas, uh, various areas of the brain to the spinal cord. And this just shows you a, uh, a transverse view through it, showing you some of the various locations of the nuclei that are processing information. There is huge amount of white matter that are axons that are going from the brain to the body and from the body to the brain. So um, lots of connectivity between different parts of the brain. The PONS is a relay station that uh, relays information between the motor cortex and the cerebellum. So the cerebellum is going to be involved in coordinating all of our motions. It takes information from um, from receptors in your joints, receptors in your muscle tissue, your uh, equilibrium, so information coming from your inner ear of equilibrium. It also takes into consideration visual input and coordinates all that information. And there has to be a way that all that information gets to the, to the cerebellum. It does that through the pons. This is also involved, uh, uh, the pons is also involved in regulating the rhythm of your breathing. So if you get smacked in the back of the head and the pons is damaged, your breathing will be irregular or it will actually stop. So you can see that there are many descending tracks and ascending tracks. Descending tracks carry information from your, um, from your motor neurons to various um, places uh, in your body. Ascending tracks carry sensory information from the um, spinal cord to the higher centers of the brain. We have regions of the of the pons that are going to be dealing with respiratory uh, activity, the rhythmicity, the rhythm of respiration, and uh, there's also parts of the reticular formation there that are um, helping in outgoing motor commands and in, in processing incoming sensory information. But we'll talk about that reticular formation again in just a few minutes. So you can see that it does extend through the medulla through the medulla, the pons, and the midbrain, that reticular formation. There are many, coming out of the pons, there are many cranial nerves, but we'll talk about cranial nerves with a separate lecture. And this is showing you a picture of the 
of the uh, ponds showing you there are nuclei, but there are also there also is white matter and tracks of information going through. So you can think of these as light, lights and lots and lots and lots of wires going through connecting various parts of the um, of the cerebellum and the higher brain centers and the spinal cord and the um, and the centers above. The medulla is going to control heart rate, blood vessel diameter, um, respiratory rate, vomiting, coughing. It's a really important part of your brain. And you can see there's lots of areas that have gray matter and lots of white matter. So there is processing ability and there are also conducting ability through the white matter. The medulla is involved in so many different things. Um, there are reflex centers for respiration in the cardiovascular system, controlling you know things like uh, the rate of the heart and the the pace uh, of the of the of respiration or breathing. Um, so it uh, is a relay center for information going to the thalamus. There are lots of um, nuclei serving different uh, cranial nerves that we can see there. Part of the reticular formation is there. Okay, so lots of things are going on and the medulla. The cerebellum uh, is going to be uh, a large portion of your of the back part of your brain and it processes information from the motor cortex, the proprioceptors, these are receptors in your joints and muscle tissue. Uh, it coordinates visual pathways, equilibrium pathways to provide coordinated skeletal muscle movements. If I remove your cerebellum you don't have coordinated muscle movements any longer. Um, it's a beautiful part of the brain. It looks like a piece of cauliflower cut in cross-section, but you can see the gray matter and the white matter. Um, the white matter is, um, is going to be connecting um, the, the gray matter to other parts of the brain. There are these uh, cerebellar uh, peduncles, which link the, um, the uh, cerebellum to parts like the midbrain, diencephalon, and cerebrum. There is the middle peduncles which carry communications between the cerebellum and the pons and then the inferior peduncles uh, link the cere uh, cerebellum with the medulla and the spinal cord so you can see these are linkages these are these are going to be tracks of nerves that are coming through that are linking various parts of the brain to the cerebellum so that all that information can be processed by the cerebellum and then it can communicate to the brain and body what needs to be done to coordinate movements the cerebellum does many other things beyond that, but um, but those are just a few things that it does for this for our purposes. The reticular formation is going to be maintaining alertness in the cerebrum. It's uh, it acts as a filter of of most of your stimuli. 99% uh, of all stimuli don't get to the brain or to your conscious awareness. Now, if something is painful, if something is life threatening. You better believe the reticular formation is going to send that stimuli to the brain so that you can um, respond to that and, and get yourself out of harm's way. Uh, it also, this reticular formation is also going to regulate skeletal and, and visceral muscle activity. Um, so it's involved in a lot of different kinds of things. You can see the reticular formation here. It's in green. And you can see information is coming in and then being uh, taken to the right location um, for the correct um, for the correct interpretation and the, the correct response to the incoming information. <clears throat> and lastly, we have a limbic system. The limbic system is not an anatomical uh, system in the brain. It's more of a functional system of the brain. So there are parts, um, you know, parts of the thalamus, parts of the hypothalamus, parts of the, uh, of the various cortices that are going to be involved in, um, in creating um, the actual anatomy of the limbic system, but functionally the system's held together, but anatomically they're made of different parts that we've already talked about. Some of the main parts of the limbic system include the hypothalamus, the thalamus, the amygdala, and the hippocampus. These are major portions of it, but there are, um, are, are many other portions. Um, this system makes up what we call our emotional brain. Uh, it, of course, controls emotions. And if you take a look here, you can see that there are many parts of the limbic system. This just t shows you the thalamus, the hypothalamus. Um, you know, parts of it would include the reticular formation. Um, there is the cingulate gyrus of the uh, of the frontal lobe. Um, there is the uh, parahippocampal gyrus. 
Um, and then uh, these are all parts of uh, other brain parts, but they're, uh, they're functionally part of the limbic system. Okay, so we have the amygdala and the hippocampus. So these things are involved in, in, in creating emotions. Um, there are many things like memory that are, that are controlled here. And uh, so this is a pretty important part of the brain. Okay, well that concludes, um, I do have a brain dissection I'll put online for you to take a look at, but that concludes uh, a little bit about some of the anatomy and physiology or functioning of the brain parts. Uh, we will, in our next uh, slideshow or, or uh, PowerPoint uh, lecture, we will look at the cranial nerves. So until then, I wish you a good day.